Good morning. I'm Carlton Sharp, pastor of Faith Christian Center Church right here in Beaumont, Texas. And we're here on what's happening in our neighborhood. And so today my special guest is Judge Baylor Wortham. Welcome, Judge. Good morning, Pastor Sharp. Good hey, to be here. Thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a lifelong resident of Jefferson County, and um, I'm a lawyer here practicing. I've been married for about almost 12 years. My wife and I have a little boy and a little girl. My son's five years old. My daughter just turned two. And um, right now I'm the uh, presiding judge of the 136th District Court. So it's exciting times in the Wortham family, I <laughs> suppose you could say. And, and look, look, I mean, you followed in the steps of your father, who was a judge also. Well, you can say that. My, you know, when I, when I started my career, I started off with the Jefferson County DA's office as an assistant prosecutor. Uh, and, of course, at the time, my dad was on the bench as judge of the 58th District Court. Um, but when my dad started his career, he also started the DA's office, that same office. Um, and then I had the opportunity after about three and a half years to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office to be a federal prosecutor. Uh, for those who may know my dad, he was appointed by uh, Ronald Reagan to be the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Texas for, you know, uh, and held that post for 12 years. So going over to that office that he had also uh, spent much of his career was also kind of a, uh, a neat thing to be able to accomplish. And then, of course, I ran for the bench and my dad had spent time on the bench. So, you know, it's, it's uh, definitely there's been a lot of... Uh, uh, tracking of my career, um, but you know, as, as far as the uh, things that my dad has done, but but I still have yet to accomplish anything even remotely close to what my father's accomplished over his legal career. Now, now is that something? I mean, growing up, seeing your father in the legal practice, is that something that you had always aspired to do? Well, I always had a lot of admiration for my dad because he took public service so very seriously. Um, you know, for him. The, the compensation was knowing that he was making the community a better place to live, knowing that he was able to bring about change that was meaningful uh, and not necessarily just something that you can, you know, try and put on a headline but doesn't actually have any substance. Uh, and, and speaking over the course of my career, you know, with so many of the agents that work with him as I got, as I got older, it really made me appreciate, you know, the work that my father did um, as a lawyer. And so I've, I've always held public service and uh, in, in the highest regard because in, in growing up that that was uh, just something that we were raised to always truly appreciate and, and sincerely uh, uh, never take for granted. Now, now, now you're the judge of the 136 District Court. Correct. Now, now there, 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 there are some, some things that are happening now like the just, uh, justice gap. That, that Let's talk about that for a few moments. Yeah, I, I've spent a lot of time also uh, on leadership of the state bar. Um, I was on the Young Lawyers Board of Directors for six years, and I was also uh, a representative for the Young Lawyers Division of the ABA. And one of the things that's really happening that we're noticed as a problem in our legal system is, is we're having uh, something that's called the justice gap. Um, traditionally, if, if uh, somebody needs legal representation for important and essential legal matters, uh, if, you, if you have someone who is at poverty level or below, they qualify for what's called pro bono assistance. Okay, okay. So they can go, and, and it's, it's funded by private funding, state funding, and I think even a portion is, is federal funding. Uh, and so low-income individuals who, you know, perhaps uh, need to probate a will of a family member or, or are going through a divorce and are dealing with child custody, uh, they have legal services that are provided to them free of charge. But what we've found is, is that there are individuals that are technically above the poverty level yeah. that, that make too much money to qualify for pro, pro bono assistance, but are unable to afford uh, legal services. And, and so as a result, because they don't have access to pro bono care, but they also aren't able to, uh, don't have the finances to go and, and hire a lawyer to represent, uh, to represent them, they end up representing themselves. Um, and so you can imagine how this is a, a tremendous problem <laughs> right. for, for two people that, that are probably going through divorce and have legitimate issues about custody of the children. Neither one of them can afford an attorney, and so they both walk into court trying to address this issue, and, and the judge is kind of an impasse uh, because the judge does not represent the people in the courtroom. Right, right, right. They're just merely a referee uh, and, and to make sure that the process moves efficiently. And so all sorts of mistakes and things uh, can happen. Uh, as you can imagine, the the you know, the legal system's not very user-friendly. In fact, you've got, you've got people that go to school for three years to learn all the procedural rules, all the evidentiary rules, all the substantive rules, all the jurisdictional rules, uh, and then come out and get a law license, and even they get it wrong. 
Wow. So many so, times. So a person that don't have no knowledge of that, of course, you, you, I, I think that's the old saying, the, the worst lawyer is law, trying to be the lawyer for yourself when you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's the old adage that, uh, you know, a person who, ha who, who uh, has himself, a person who decides to be their own lawyer uh, has a fool for a client. <laughs> but, yeah. It, it, but, but it's true, but, but, but sadly for a lot of these individuals, it's not a situation where they choose to represent themselves, it's because they have to represent themselves. Wow. And, and so trying to address the issue, you know, the, the, the demand for just for pro bono services alone greatly exceeds the supply. There's far more people in need of pro bono representation than are of lawyers available. So trying to expand pro bono services even further just strains a system that's already, um, you know, incredibly uh, overwhelmed. So, the, so, so the, the state bar has looked at this issue and said, you know, we need to find some resolution or some mechanism to try and solve this problem uh, because until we do, we're, we're constantly going to have people that are trying to get, you know, result that, that, that are entitled and need justice, uh, you know, the law and the facts is on their side, but, but they don't have, you know, the legal representation, legal knowledge in order to get the result that the law uh, it provides to them. So, so, so what, what remedy do you have? I mean, because if, if, if I'm just above the poverty line, but yet, I don't make enough to, to, to hire an attorney. I mean, what options do I have? Well, that's, that's where we've, we've struggled. The state bar and, uh, and the leadership uh, within the state of Texas have tried to find some ways to remedy this. One of the things that's proposed that's, that's helped, although it's, it's really just been more, you know, just a few drops in the bucket to alleviate the, the growing problem, um, but we've implemented uh, what are kind of called reduced fee arrangements where there are certain lawyers that will say if you fall into the, the justice gap ah, yeah. and you need someone to help just draft the divorce decree so that you and someone that, that you both mutually agree you don't want to be married to one another, you know, uh, that they would agree that policy would dictate that, you know, that they be allowed to go their separate ways, that they will do a, a, a greatly reduced fee gotcha. to still be gotcha. able to cover the cost, still be able to cover the, the basic um, tenets of what it takes to represent that case. They're not necessarily making any money off of it but allows the, those individuals that, that are struggling financially to still be able to have access to those legal services. Um, naturally, we've also, there's been an effort by the state bar to ask the legislature to provide more funding and more money to help uh, provide low income uh, representation. But of course, you know, the legislature is uh, uh, very tight on their budget and, and uh, you know, has not yet provided that funding. And, and then, uh, you know, lastly, there's been an effort to try and make certain types of legal processes more user friendly right, so right. that individuals that are going to do an uncontested divorce may be able to go and navigate those waters uh, without the assistance of a lawyer. Although I, I still think that sets up a very slippery slope because just filling out a form doesn't, <laughs> always, doesn't always have the, the legal familiarity to answer right, a lot of the questions right. that someone has and make, sure, and make sure that somebody, you know, one side or the other is not properly being taken care of. Also, there's... There's no, there's not nearly as much oversight to protect, you know, against conflict of interest and other things that could arise that a lawyer who's trained to spot those things would, would be able to address that, that an individual just checking a box on a form and may not necessarily know about. So it, it's something that we're trying to address, uh, but, but sadly every year when you look at the statistics and the number of people that are uh, engaging in self-representation, it just continues to grow. Right. And, and so I don't see this being a trend that's going to go away. And I, and, and so we're, you know, every year we, we sit down and try and find more and more ways to address it, and it's, and it's just a quagmire that just sadly doesn't have a very obvious answer. Now, another issue is uh, that th is the voter, uh, the voter, uh, the bill, oh, the, voter, ID, the ID bill. The voter ID bill. Yeah, yeah. There has been a lot of discussion. Uh, you know, I just ran for office last year, obviously, and then began my term on January 1st. But, you know, one of the things that I had more questions about you know, when I was out campaigning more than anything, were questions about the voter ID bill. Because you, you, when it was passed, you saw a lot of things on the news, and then we went to the courts, and uh, the lower courts had uh, addressed it, and then essentially had struck it down, saying that uh, it, it potentially it, it disproportionately disenfranchised certain voters. And, you know, I, I always try not to be very partisan on how I, I really tackle a lot of these issues, but when I looked at what the bill sought to accomplish and then what the bill, how they implemented it, it didn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, 
And so, for instance, the, the whole argument of, of requiring ID when you go to vote, uh -huh. it's, uh, it's under the basic premise of saying, well, we need to secure the ballot box, we need to secure the vote to make sure that people aren't voting multiple times or voting for other individuals. And, and I think everybody would agree that, you know, our right to vote is a fundamental part of our democracy and, and that, you know, if someone casts a ballot, the person who, who votes needs to be voting for themselves and not for someone else. Right, right. Um, so the solution to what they proposed was that someone have to produce a photo ID or a government document that would show I'm the person that's coming to vote. Um, but see, the, the, the problem is, is that that is arguably one of the worst ways you could go about and uh, accomplishing that means. Uh, when I work for the Department of Justice, I mean, we use biometrics. Uh, biometrics are very inexpensive. So you could take a thumbprint. A thumbprint. Scan a thumbprint and uh, be able to very quickly uh, surmise the identity of a person from a thumbprint. Uh, the biometric technology is very inexpensive. I mean, over the, over the last 20, 30 years since it's been developed, it's become much more uh, affordable. And a thumbprint is something that is very difficult to forge. Or yeah, I mean, nobody has the same thumbprint. Right. So, But by comparison, a driver's license is something that is very commonly counterfeited. In fact, you go to any college campus, <laughs> that's right. I mean, hey. you're going to see counterfeit IDs everywhere. Yeah, well, 18-year-old got a 21, 22-year-old driver's license. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, if you used a biometric and you wanted to see if any one person voted twice in the same, same race, you, you could literally, with a few keystrokes, do a search and see if the same fingerprint or thumbprint showed up um, at, any, at any two polling locations. And it, without much difficulty, they would, they would have a lot of confidence that people would have in that system. Um, but again, with driver's licenses, I mean, like you said, uh, you go to any college campus and you know a guy that for 30 bucks will you know, get you an ID to say whatever it is you want to say <laughs> on it. Um, so the, but so the greater problem, and, and this is what a lot of people who were against the bill pointed out, is that the people that really get disenfranchised are the individuals that don't normally have driver's licenses, which uh -huh. are the most common form used. I mean, if you don't have a driver's license, odds are you don't have a passport either. Right, right. Um, and so the two groups of individuals that, that tend to not have driver's licenses are the poor, i.e. people that cannot afford to own an automobile, so what's the point of having a driver's right. license? Uh, and then the elderly who, who, because of their medical situation, aren't able to drive themselves. Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, the AARP and other uh, groups that, that are looking out for people, especially individuals or people that are homeless, you know, they still have the same constitutional right to be able to go and vote. Um, and so I think if, you know, there's a very simple solution to the problem um, that could be addressed by just changing the type of identification that, uh, that people will, will, will seek to use whenever they go to the ballot box, um, and, but for whatever reason, there's just never been any discussion about that. And so when, when people start getting on partisan lines saying, well, this is really more of a, an effort to suppress, you know, the voters of people that may not be able to, you know, the low-income voters, uh, I mean, I, I think it gives some su support to some of those arguments, but I think the legislature can, in, can solve that, you know, and quell everybody's concerns by looking into using some of these other means to track the individuals that actually go to the polling location. Okay. Now, another another issue that that's really, I mean, is is, is happening right now, is uh, the freedom of the press. I mean, you can uh, say that again. Uh, <laughs> but you, but I mean, you 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 literally see it. You know that they're trying to you know put a damper on the press. Well, we one of the other things we take granted, I think, for having our constitutional rights in this country, when we talk about having the freedom of the press, is the press doesn't always get it right. I mean, every any reporter you talk to is you know, if an ethical reporter will make every effort they can to verify the information and report the information if they believe the source of the information is credible. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. Um, you also have the issue that where now the news has kind of gotten into the money-making business rather than the public uh, inf information business. Right. So you're, you're also dealing with slant and spin that's been put on certain information. But, but I think people need to distinguish um, information that uh, in good faith is being sought, that's being presented to the best of the knowledge of the reporter, that may have some spin or some slant on it, but ultimately is brought in the interest of, sh of bringing information to the public's knowledge that's of public importance. And you have to distinguish that from information that is intentionally false. And, and so, you know, the National Enquirer would be probably an example where uh, it, more of the sensational issue, or they're intentionally putting out uh, a report that is false, but they want to 
mislead and, and draw people to another conclusion right, right. based upon uh, inherently wrong information that the people issuing the information know is wrong. Um, you know, one of the tenets of, of our democracy is the fact that we have checks and balances and, uh, uh, and, and the freedom of our press to be able to go and openly report information that's in the public's interest uh, is inherently protected uh, is something that many people probably don't really appreciate. If you go to China, that's if right. you go to Russia, yeah, yeah. you know, they don't have that autonomy. <laughs> the state, the government owns all the news reporting industries. And so you don't have investigative journalism, journalism in those countries. And the few uh, non-governmental reporters that have gone and attempted, especially in Russia, that have tried to do, you know, real, real investigative journalism uh, have wound up face down in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, one of the issues that we look at when we talk about our democracy being under attack is, is now there's more of a conceited effort uh, from, you know, not just people in Washington, D.C., but, you know, political pundits that love to throw around the term fake news. And, and so when you turn on the nightly news on ABC or NBC or even your local news and they say, don't, don't listen to that, it's all fake right, news. Right. You know, there's, there's people that inherently believe that and, and there's truthful, accurate information, regardless what side of the aisle you're on uh, that's, that's being reported, uh, that is means to serve as checks and balances that, that are, people are being encouraged to disregard. And uh, so I, I, don't, I, I think that's something that, that's inherently dangerous. I, I think if, if you have an issue with information that's being presented, the solution isn't to go bury your head in the sand, it's to go to present your own countervailing point or to go to present your own information right. and challenge those ideas. Uh, because like you said, sometimes they get it wrong and if you can go and, and uh, and you know, present your countervailing side or the argument, or say why that's that's untrue. Then, um, uh, at the end of the day, the the right message will will be put out there and will prevail. Uh, but uh, but just just to you know dismiss the the, the integrity of our of our national media, uh, I, I think can have very grave and lingering consequences um, um, if you look at the history of our country and, and where we're headed. Now, now you you also do some work locally with uh, with Reverend J D Roberts uh, with Save Our Children. I, oh, mean, I do. So, so I know in the days to come that he's going to be having Know Your County Courthouse. So tell us about the work that you do with, with Save Our Children. J.D.'s been a, a good friend of mine for many, many years, um, and, and I supported Save Our Children long before I ever had any, you know, inkling or desire to ever run for office. Um, but, but the one thing that I think is unique, and I, and I give J.D. credit for recognizing the issue uh, and, and trying to address it and doing it in a, in a cultural, generational sense, is, you know, in our community, there, there's often so much distrust with our justice system, with law enforcement, with our courthouse, and, and you see it when people come to court, they just assume that, oh, the system's rigged, you don't get a fair shake, and, and I'll say that's not the truth. There are so many protections that are built in to our justice system to protect the individual liberties and freedoms of individuals who have been charged with a crime, um, that that is the safeguard for individuals. Um, and, uh, and so people need to know that the courthouse is a place where justice is, is, uh, is brought about, not, not that it's swept under a rug. Right, right. And so, the, but, so trying to change that perception um, and letting, and letting uh, you know, the children of our community who, who may have, have that longstanding belief or, or whose parents and grandparents always had that belief, to have them come into the courthouse, come into an actual courtroom and say, you know, Come sit in the jury box for yourself. This, this is what members of the community, your community, see yeah. every single day on important issues affecting not just criminal cases, but civil cases, uh, case matters involving real estate. You know, if a bank is gonna come and try and take away your home because it's being foreclosed, they don't have the right to just do that carte blanche. They have to go through the court system. And, and honestly, and, it, and it's not an uncommon occurrence, that someone will show up, you know, present their evidence, and then they'll be right, and the bank was wrong. And the individual person is able to save their home from, from uh, you know, a, a lending institution that was trying to unfairly or, or sometimes illegally foreclose on another person's home. You know, justice is accomplished in the walls of that courtroom. But, but if you're taught to believe that you can't win in that courtroom, yeah, I mean, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure because a lot of people don't show up. Right, and, right. And, and so the, the person that does not show up and, and to have their day in court is guaranteed to not prevail. <laughs> 
So, so now, Judge, now, now during this time of Know Your County Courthouse, when, when, when Reverend Roberts bring the children in, do you do you let them sit behind in your in your big chair and let them hit the gavel? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> That's, you know, there's a there's a there's a misconception. You know, my name is above the front doors of the courtroom, but that is not my courtroom. That right. is the people's courtroom. That belongs to the people of this community. That is their forum for justice. And, and so when they come in, I mean, look, they say, this courtroom belongs, if you're a member of this community, this, this belongs to you. This is your avenue for justice. And so, you know, come, yeah, I'll, I'll invite anybody. Uh, come sit in the judge's chair if you want to. This is your courtroom. Come sit in the witness chair. Come sit at council table. And, and, and my goal is for them to feel comfortable, and not just if they have an, uh, their own issue that, that needs to be resolved and they need to come to the courtroom, but, but if they get a jury summons, know that your jury service matters. You know, the, because it's members of the community that decide whether or not someone who's charged, mm -hmm. whether, whether it be a speeding ticket or a capital murder, is convicted of that crime. Wow. Well, listen, I, I want to I thank the judge for coming to talk to us about these issues today and thank him for being involved with Save Our Children, uh, especially with the upcoming event, Know Your County Courthouse. And I want to thank him for that. And I want to thank you for watching today on what's happening in our neighborhood. And we will see you next time on our broadcast.